So I want to share something with you today, and I won't be before you long, but I do think it's important to talk about how God sees our mothers and also to encourage mothers in this place so that you can truly be all God wants you to be and experience all God wants you to experience. And so I'm going to take you to a couple of scriptures here, starting with Proverbs chapter 31. Moms matter to God. I'm going to say it again. Moms matter to God. Turn to him and tell him, tell him moms, moms matter, matter to God. God. Yeah, they do. They matter to God. And so Proverbs 31, 28, we have the chapter describing the virtuous woman, the diamond. And so the Bible is describing this woman. It's praising this woman. And I want to read verse 28. It says, her children stand and bless her. So notice that this woman is a mother and her children stand and bless her. The implication here is her children giving her a standing, cheering ovation. A standing, cheering ovation. You know, often we think about Mother's Day, we think about women who gave birth to children, but there are other women who are mothers in a different way. And so last night I did the home going for one of our charter members, Cheryl Lang. And Cheryl did not have any children of her own, but she had a younger brother who she basically raised. And not only that, but she was kind of a mother to the family. And there was a moment last night where they all stood up and cheered, gave her a standing cheering ovation. And that's what we're seeing here. This is what happens to the virtuous woman. This is uh, what happens to the wonderful mother. Her children are rising up and praising her. If you keep reading, her husband is praising her because she is a wonderful woman, because she is a wonderful mother. And this is actually something we see in the Bible over and over again, God highlighting and honoring mothers. So, for example, we see the story of Hannah. She couldn't have any children, but she believed God. And God gave her a son named Samuel, and she kept her promise to God. She dedicated him to the Lord. We read about Sarah. In fact, the Bible says in Hebrews 11, 11, that it was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child. Though she was barren and was too old, she believed God that he would keep his promise God honors her because she had the faith to be a mother. God honors, of course, Moses' his mother, had the faith to do whatever it took to save his life. God honors Timothy's mother and grandmother for their faith. And, of course, we all know that God honors Mary, the mother of Jesus. Throughout the Bible, we see God highlighting and honoring mothers, telling us their stories so that we can learn from them. In Ephesians chapter 6, the Bible tells us what we ought to be doing when it comes to our mothers. It says, honor, somebody say honor. Honor, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with the promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you, and you will have a long life on the earth. So notice this command. Now, if you were to back up, you find that he was talking to children here. But if you go back to Exodus chapter 20, you'll find that this did not just apply to children. This applied to adults. So as adults, we are to honor our mothers. And the word honor here means to prize, to value, to revere. So we can read that, that we ought to see our mothers as a prize that we ought to value our mothers, that we ought to reverence our mothers. And I want you to notice that this is something that we're all supposed to do no matter whether or not we feel like we had a good mother. 
whether or not we feel like she did a good job. God is showing us here we ought to honor our mothers simply because they hold the position of mother in our lives. In fact, what's really wild about this is that not only is this a commandment from God, the Bible says this is the first commandment with a promise. So this must be important to God to tag on a bonus here, to tag on a promise blessing. If you do this, I'm going to do this for you. If you do this, you're going to live well and you're going to live long. Why? Because I want you to honor your mother. I think a great example of, of this, of how God thinks about this, is, is, is right in front of us. I have here some china, and then I've got plastic. And what God is revealing to us is that you should not treat your mother like plastic. I don't care what she did or didn't do. And sometimes as children, we can be arrogant. Well, she should have did this and she should have did that. And she, well, maybe, but maybe not. One of the things that happens when you get a little older and you find yourself in the shoes of your parent is that you now understand a little bit more than you did when you were younger. And so, no, God, this is one reason why God doesn't put conditions on this. Honor your mother. Don't treat her like plastic. And I don't know about you all, but in my house, one of the things that we end up doing, even though we've got all kinds of plates and silverware, is we go find the plastic stuff. We go find the paper plates. Why? We don't feel like washing the dishes. Am I the only one that's like that? Is my house the only one that's like that? Like we spend all this money on all this china and all these plates, and then we don't ever use them. And we go ahead and spend even more money on paper plates and because we're so lazy that we don't want to have to wash but what happens when you get done eating a paper plate off a paper plate you you cheerfully throw it away I don't have to wash that but I mean no there are a couple times a year where you might bring out the fine china and you know and when I grew up in my mother's house there was a china cabinet right you didn't go in there like you could break a plate but don't break one of those plates Anybody know what I'm talking about? Surely my grandmama's house, you, you, you almost didn't even want to look at it. What you looking at, boy? No, nothing. <laughs> nothing. Right? Why? This is valuable. This is not our mother's. This is our mother's. We should value them, prize them, honor them. And John... Chapter 19, we find ourselves in, one of the middle, in the middle of one of the most intense moments in history. And it's when Jesus was literally hanging on the cross. He'd been beaten. He'd been impaled. He's now naked, hanging on this cross, dying. And in verse 26, the Bible says that when Jesus therefore saw his mother... And the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. What's happening here? Well, that disciple is John. Jesus knows he's about to die. He also knows he's going to rise again and then go to heaven. And it was generally understood that men take care of their mothers. That was the societal norm. In fact, that's why Peter, or Paul said what he said in 1 Timothy. He said, if a man doesn't take care of his own house, and he was talking about widows, first of all. So in other words, a mother who's a widow, or even an auntie who's a widow, etc. if he doesn't take care of them, doesn't provide for them, he's worse than an infidel. That's what the Bible says. He's worse than a sinner. He can name the name of Jesus all he wants, but he doesn't act in a way that Jesus feels is respectful toward his mother or other women in his family. Jesus is like, mm-mm. And so it was understood that that's what men do. Obviously, you read Jesus' story, Joseph clearly had passed away. So he was the one that took care of Mary. But in this moment, knowing what was about to happen, he looks at John 
and he says, behold your mother. He's saying from now on, that's your mother. What's he saying? Take care of her. And what's he saying to us today? Behold your mother. What's he saying to us today? Take care of her. Be there for her. Value her. And here's something else we ought to do. We ought to pray for her. James 5, 16 says this. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. What's he telling us here? Well, even as believers, we ought to spend time praying for each other and not just throwing up a quick prayer, but he, this is talking about a heartfelt, continued prayer. This person is my prayer project. I might spend some hours praying for this person. And the Bible tells us when we pray like that for each other, we help each other be healed. Those type of prayers produce results. They produce supernatural results. Some of us are here because our mothers pray like that for us. Anybody say that? Yeah, my mama's prayer is what got me here. Yeah, see a lot of people, right? So now it's time to return the favor. There's a story in, in Luke chapter 4 that God pointed out to me as I was preparing. It says, after leaving the synagogue that day, Jesus went to Simon's home where he found Simon's mother-in-law very sick with a high fever. Please heal her, everyone begged. And standing at her bedside, he rebuked the fever and it left her. And she got up at once and prepared a meal for them. Simon's mother-in-law was very sick with the high fever. And Jesus came in and delivered her, healed her. Some of us have mothers that are suffering right now. And you don't always know. You know, the last person that sometimes a mother would tell is a child, their child. You might be 70, but you're their child, right? Right? And uh, I heard a funny story coming in today. One of our team members is watching their grand, grandkids today and, and was joking around that she, she will spank them. And if, if they mess up, she'll not only spank them, but she'll tell them, I'm going to spank you when your mother gets here. I'm going to spank her too. <laughs> I thought that was funny. But you know, moms, revelation, moms go through stuff too. Sometimes they may not be sick with a high fever, but they got some things going on. And they need us to spend our time praying for them, just like they spent their time praying for us. And when we pray for our mothers, our prayers have caused wonderful things to happen. They have wonderful results. This is one of the ways that you honor your mother, by, that you value her, that you prize her, is you take care of her in every way, including spiritually. You pray for her. And I believe that's what God wants because moms matter to God. Even if your mother is a little older in life, man, God's got some amazing things left for her to do. He's got some great things he wants her to experience. And Satan wants to stop those things. And if you'll jump in in prayer, you can help God bring to pass in her life everything he wants to bring to pass in her life. So, yeah, we ought to honor our mothers today. We ought to honor them with our hearts, value them, see them as a prize. We ought to honor them with our words. That's a part of it. That's part of what we're doing today, you know, telling our, our mothers we love them and, you know, giving them cards. And uh, that also means there's a certain way we won't talk to them. We're not going to dishonor them by how we talk to them. I don't care how they talk to us. It's one thing that we got to get as Christians. We got to get past this idea that I only do right if somebody does right to me. I don't even know why I'm talking about that. It's not my message. But, you know, I see, you know, I'm on social media a lot, learning and sometimes just bored. And I see a lot, man, of, of just comments that people make. And anytime someone wants to post something about how to be a good husband, good wife, good this, good that, you jump in the comments and the response is, well, when they do this. I saw something yesterday and they were talking about 
a husband's needs. And you get in the comments and the, the ladies are all like, well, why aren't you talking about what a woman needs? Can you just take a moment <laughs> and look in the mirror just for a moment, not get a, hold of, get a hold of the idea that you're supposed to do right, period. Your mama might have the nastiest attitude. Now, there may be a reason. Maybe I need to look past what she's saying and doing and maybe try to see her heart and see where she's hurting. And maybe I don't add to it by being someone that's t attacking her. I don't know why I'm talking about that. I'm talking to somebody here today because I know some people's day, day, Mother's Day is, is different things for different people. For some people, your mother's no longer here and it's a day that's kind of sad for you and you have to be reminded that if she is a believer, she is enjoying life unspeak, joy unspeakable, right? She is in a great, great place right now and you'll see her again. Some people, you know, you're believing God to be a mother and God's got you. God did it for Hannah, God did it for Sarah, and God will do it for you. Amen. And some people, your mama ain't exactly your favorite person. And yet, you're supposed to honor her. It's so one of the things that I, I've done a lot of things wrong, just like anybody else. But I feel like my parents would stand here and agree with this, that I've always honored them. That I don't, I can't even remember speaking a cross word to either one of my parents. And we have not always agreed on things. There has not always been great moments just like with any other family. And I think that's one reason why God's been able to bless me. It's also another reason why my children don't speak cross words to me. It just doesn't happen. At one time, one of my kids kind of said something. And 30 seconds later, without me saying it, you know, I said, I did say something. Let me catch myself. I said something. I said, I am not one of your friends. <laughs> You're not going to talk to me like that. And it took 30 seconds, and then they, they were tr truly heartfelt. I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have did that, you know, because it's so rare, right? Because that's a pattern that's been established. And even if you feel like your mother isn't what you want her to be, hasn't treated you the way you think a, you, a child should be treated, well, start a new tradition in your family. Treat her right, and then watch God make sure you're taken care of as well. Honor her. If she deserves it, honor her. If she doesn't deserve it, honor her. Now, I want to give a few things to mothers. I told you I won't be before you long. I, read, I came across this book, I'm pretty sure I read it years ago, called Maximized Manhood. And it was written by Ed Cole, and it talked about how to be the, the man God wants you to be. And I remember reading that as a young man. But as I was thinking about this today, I said, well, we could talk about some maximized momhood. How can you be the mom God wants you to be? And I'm going to give you just a couple things quickly. Number one, embrace your responsibility. Embrace. Somebody say Embrace. Embrace it. Don't reject it. Don't run from it. Don't complain about it. Embrace your responsibility. What's that responsibility? Psalm, excuse me, Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. The New Living Translation says, direct your children onto the right path. And when they are older, they will not leave it. You are your child's personal trainer. I've said this before, but when you receive a child, a child's born into this world, you're given a blank white sheet of paper. That's their spirit. Whatever's in their spirit is what's going to be in their life. And whatever's in their spirit will be because of what you wrote there or you allowed somebody else to write there. That's a huge responsibility. The outcome of their life is actually in your hands. That's what this is saying. If you train them in the way they should go, even when they are old, that training is going to guide them. Even when they're old. So as children, you, as parents, we need to train our children, which means not only teaching, but example. And we need to train them to live the right lifestyle, to stay on the path of the just, 
to do things God's way. And the Bible says do it by teaching them the Bible in the morning and at night and throughout the day as you travel, talk to them about God's ways. And then, of course, live it in front of them. I, I saw a billboard once just driving on 94, I think it was, on one of these freeways, and it said women or children rarely do what they've heard. They only do what they've seen. And so train them in that way with the goal of raising a champion. Because that's what God wants you to do. He wants you to raise champions for Christ. The Bible calls them mighty seed. The Bible calls them warriors. That's what God wants. He wants your child not to just be like everybody else. He wants them to be 10 times smarter, stronger, wiser, more anointed, more impactful. You're raising a champion. Just like somebody who took Mike Tyson, and if you don't know who that is, some, most of us know who Mike Tyson is, but probably one of the greatest boxers of all time. Where I saw a video of him a couple of days ago when he was 15 years old in a boxing match. And you know, I had to think about it, man. You imagine what it must be like to get a, even a 12, 13 year old Mike Tyson. <laughs> Beyond the issues of just a young man who had a bit of a tough upbringing, you have in your hands the potential to create a legendary fighter, a world champion that people would talk about even 30 years after their prime. That's what you have with your children. You might be raising a Peter. You might be raising a David. You might be raising a Paul. You might be raising a Deborah. We don't know anything about Deborah. We're going to re we're reading through the book of Judges later this month. You know, we're doing our, our Bible reading. Anybody still doing your Bible reading? Every, okay. Three people raised their hand. <laughs> Come on, wisdom is the principal thing, right? We preached on that. She was, a, she was a judge and the president, right? That's one reason why we know there's nothing wrong with women preachers. God had women preachers in the Old Testament. You have a task, the task of raising a champion. And I ran across this one quote by uh, actually the football coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers. He said, when you're a coach that's talking about somebody can't learn, you're seeking comfort because your teaching is struggling. And sometimes we do that as parents. We do it as pastors. We, we act like, well, it's the kid's fault. They can't figure this out. They just, they just, you know, they're just this, they're just that. But you're the teacher. Take responsibility for the fact that you need to find a way to connect with that child, with that student, with that player, with that member, and do it. Embrace your God-given responsibility. Number two, Joshua chapter 9, verse 14. Uh, just to give you an idea of the story uh, Israel was, they were taken over the promised land. They had commands to wipe out everybody that they came in contact with. And one of the nations that they were supposed to fight against was the nation, or we can just call them the city of Gibeon. And the people of Gibeon were terrified of Israel. And what they decided to do was to trick them. So they took their men, just a few of them, and they, they, they took all their older stuff, like their old saddles and their old sandals, and they got old moldy bread, and they, they put all of that together. And then they went and traveled to where Israel was, and they said, we've come from a far land. Look at how old our stuff is. We've been traveling for a very long time, and we've come just to make a covenant with you. And, and Joshua and Israel were like, well, how do we know that you're not from around here? Because we can't make a covenant with you. If you're from around here, we're supposed to take you out. But they tricked them into thinking they had come from a far land. And so the Bible teaches that then Joshua and Israel made a covenant with them and then figured out later, these folk are right from right around the corner. And so now they had, been, they had disobeyed what God said. Well, how does that happen? How do you even get tricked like that? Verse 14, so the Israelites examined their food, but they did not consult the Lord. Oh, there's your answer. Number two, for mothers, follow God's directions, not your own. 
not societies, not what YouTube says, not what Google says, not what your neighbor says. The Bible is your book on how to raise a child. This is your training manual. Israel got in trouble because they relied on their own wisdom and they were wrong. Well, God has given you the ability to not only get his wisdom through the Bible, but also through prayer. And so make sure that you're following God's proven victory plan for your children. Number three, remember that God has rolled away the shame of your past. Maximize momhood. Remember, God has rolled away the shame of your past. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, when Joshua and Israel first came into the promised land, before God had them pick up one sword, he had Joshua circumcise all the men. I won't get too deep into what that means, but it's not comfortable for the guys. Why did God do that? Covenant. And then when he got done, they celebrated the Passover lamb. What was that? Covenant. We just did a whole series on covenant. What's going on? So God is basically, you know, once again, uh, renewing the covenant. He's kind of re-entering covenant with the nation of Israel, which basically says, hey, you be my people, I'll be your God. You do what I tell you, I'm going to give you victory over your enemies. So God did all of that. And then when he got done, he, it said, he said this, then the Lord said to Joshua, today I have rolled away the shame of your slavery in Egypt. He says, I've rolled away. What's he saying? This is a fresh start. I mean, oh, God gives fresh starts. Yeah, he gives fresh starts. But what Satan will do, even as God's trying to move you forward, is he will try to paralyze you with shame. Shame because of what others did to you, and that's what happened to Israel. They have been enslaved. It's hard to shake that off of you as a, as a nation. You know, we still struggle with that in our nation. There's still issues in the black community that just comes from a grasshopper mentality. We don't see ourselves as God made us because of how we were treated. That's not the only reason, but that is a reason. But God is a God who doesn't want you paralyzed by the shame of what somebody else did to you. And he doesn't want you paralyzed by the shame of what you did. Because it doesn't matter who you are, you've made some mistakes. And, and, and that, that's, that's real. Well, I, sometimes I think about some mistakes I made and the impact on my children or other people and, and I, I feel awful and I have to stop myself. Nope, can't do that. I've learned some lessons from it, but that's under the blood and if something needs to be fixed, I'm giving it to God to fix it. It's handled. And that's exactly what you need to do as a mother. Roll away the shame of your past. And then number four, somebody say number four. Believe for your promised land believe for your promised land. I want to read Joshua 5:11. It says the very next day they began to eat unleavened bread and roasted grain harvested from the land. No manna appeared on the day they first ate from the crops of the land. It was never seen again. So from that time on the Israelites ate from the crop of crops of Canaan. What do you say? What is this about? If you know it, the story of Israel when they were in the wilderness for 40 years, they ate what the Bible called manna from heaven. And, you know, and they had limited water. And they, so basically what God did was he provided for them supernaturally. So every day they would wake up and it was manna from heaven on the ground. But it was only just enough to eat for that day. And they only had just enough water, really, for right then. Even their clothes, they didn't, you know, the Bible teaches their clothes didn't wear out for 40 years. That's, I mean, you know, that's supernatural. Shoes didn't wear out. It was still looking good. The whole deal. So they got kept them alive, but they were living in this wilderness state where I'm just making it. And that's where some folk are right now. That's where some others are right now. Just hanging on. And you ought to thank God that you have manna from heaven. And you ought to thank God that you got water to drink. You ought to thank God to close or not. When the God has gotten you here, don't in any way, uh, take that for granted. But that is not God's best for you. When Israel finally got into the promised land, for the first time, they were able to eat from the land. 
God has said it was a land of brooks and, and all kinds of food and gold and silver and houses. And, and, and that was God's will for them all along. It was never to be in the wilderness. They were only supposed to be in the wilderness for 41 days. Because of their sins, they spent 40 years there. But God's plan was get them from Egypt to the promised land in six weeks. But they didn't get there. When they finally got there, they finally got to the place where they were able to eat from the land. The Bible teaches that they no longer needed manna from heaven. It stopped. God's got a promised land for you. Some of you have been hanging on. But God doesn't want you hanging on for the rest of your life. God doesn't want you just barely having enough, just barely surviving, just trying to just make it through till Jesus comes back. God wants you in your promised land. Mothers, God wants you in your promised land. But for you to be in your promised land, you got to believe for it. Some of us gave up on that, those dreams we had as young, younger people. Those things we used to go after, those things we used to talk about, we gave up on it because things got tough. And it's time to pick up your dream again. It's time to reignite your faith. It's time to say that God did it for others. God can do it for me. The God that kept me going all this time is the God that can bring me into everything he promised me. I think the best example of this might be a woman by the name of Sarah. Sarah was unable to have children. When we first find Sarah and her husband Abram, he is about 75 years old. She's about 65 years old. God promises Abram he'll have a son. What's implied is through his wife Sarah. So Abram does what God says, goes to the promised land. They've been there for a while. If I remember correctly, they've been there for over a decade. And nothing has changed. He doesn't have a son. She's even older than she was when they started. She decides, well, you know, so you can have a son. Why don't you go ahead and take my maid? And then whatever baby she has, that'll be my baby. Abraham, being a great man of faith and power, said, no, no. I mean, no, he didn't say that. He's like, for real? You show? Sure? You show? Sure? I ain't going to hear about this later? No, he did it. Had a child named Ishmael, then it was a problem because Hagar, the woman, you know, got the big head, and, and you know, she did not handle correctly the situation and Sarah finally said kick them out and God actually sided with Sarah in that in that moment that's a whole nother story that's what's going on in the Middle East right now it's Ishmael versus Israel but God's original plan had not changed God's promise never changed it was to give this woman a child and God appears to Abram when he's 99 she's 89 and God says, you're about to have a child. Change your name, change her name. Sarah's going to be the mother. And the Bible says in Genesis 13, verse 14, uh, 18, verse 13, that the Lord said to Abraham, well, when he said that Sarah laughed, why did Sarah laugh? Why did she say, can an old woman like me have a baby? Notice this phrase. Is anything too hard for God? Come on, there you go right there. Is anything too hard for God? Then he says, I'll return about this time next year. Sarah will have a son. And she did. Why? She chose to believe to enter her promised land. Even though she was 89 years old, she got to the place where she believed, as impossible as it seemed, that God was going to give her a son. And her faith caused her to be in the faith hall of fame. But most importantly, her faith brought her a son named Isaac, which means laughter. God still wants to give birth to some laughter in your lives. God's got some Isaacs for you. God's got some things that you've been waiting on and believing for for a long time that he wants to bring to pass in this year of the next level, in this year of acceleration. He wants to do it now. So don't be moved by what you see. Faith is not needed when you can see it. Faith is needed when you can't see it. 
Faith believes in the, in the face of impossible circumstances. That's when you need faith. So choose today to believe again. Choose today to expect that God's going to do everything he promised me. And do what we did today. Bless the Lord until you see it come to pass. So come on, lift your hands toward heaven right now. Let's just praise God and thank God. I hope that helped you. God has an amazing future for you, one that is greater than anything you can create for yourself. But the way to get to that future is to do things God's way, to actually apply what you just heard. So I want to encourage you to do just that. And also I want to encourage you to join us on Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. as our FX Nation family comes together. Be a part of FX Nation and watch God take you to heights you've never experienced before. And if you're someone that's saying, well, I'm already a part of a church somewhere, but I feel connected to your ministry, well, you sound like a partner to me. And I encourage you to go to AndreButler.com and sign up there and help us get this message about the future that God has for you all throughout the world. Now, if it happens to be on your heart to be a blessing to this ministry, you can do that. You can go to MyFaithX.com or you can download the Faith Experience app and you can give there and find a bunch more messages. But even if you're not ready to give, I want you to know that we love you. We're thanking God for the opportunity to be a blessing to you. And we know that God has an amazing future for you. I'll see you soon. Tune to our weekly podcast where you'll be able to listen to the message from our Sunday experience. Our podcast is available on platforms like Apple Podcast, Spotify, Google Play, and more. Be sure to check us out, subscribe, and share.